understand when we finish this morning, as much as it's all on Jesus and it's all on our faith, and we have to have Shula to go with the faith. And that's really what the message is all about this morning, so that's my lead-in. Here we are, we are in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, and we are at verse 30. And uh, Hebrews 11, verse 30, it's not a long verse. Matter of fact, it's a pretty short verse. If you consider all the verses in the Bible, it's not the shortest, but it's, it's, it's a pretty succinct verse. It was by faith that the people of Israel marched around Jericho for seven days, and then the walls came crashing down. That's the whole verse. Of all of the Bible stories, songs get made out of Bible stories, don't they? Away in a manger. You know what that one's all about, right? <laughs> you, 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 songs get made up. Well, probably one of the most famous songs that came out of the African American culture was about the walls of Jericho. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. Now, there's a couple of verses along the way. One of those verses says, You may talk about the men of Gideon. You may brag about the men of Saul. But there's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Capsulize the book of Joshua. Condense the story and Reader's Digest version. And you get Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. Now, how impossible is a wall coming down by people walking around in silence? Absolutely impossible. Though it was a promise from God that the impossible could happen, these people had to do something to act on their faith. God promised that a walled city, huge walled city, where scores of thousands of people lived, it had lasted for hundreds of years. Um, history tells us that Jericho is one of the first cities that is walled in the entire world. Now, unless you've got a way to bring a wall down that I don't know of, walking in silence wouldn't be the way. It would probably show up in the History Channel as infamous battles never won. What do you need to focus on when you hear the Battle of Jericho? The most important thing that you need to focus on is that it's impossible for the walls to come down without faith. How impossible? Totally, absolutely, completely, utterly. That's, we're just warming up. <laughs> Smart people would tell you that if that's the case, it is a no way, no how moment. Ever had a no way, no how moment? Ever had, a, it's time to walk away? Have you ever had one of those moments where you know the song, you got to know when to, and know when to, know when to, know when. Okay. Jericho would be, outside of the game of poker, Jericho is that. It is a no way, no how, walk away, no one to hold them, no one to fold them, no one to give up, no one to just be done. Jericho. How did Jericho happen? Opening of 11, verse 30. Two words. By faith. That's way too simple and way too simplistic. And pastor, there's got to be more to it. There had to have been an earthquake. There had to be something. No, the Bible just says, by faith. By faith. What sort of faith causes walls to come down? God faith. What kind of catastrophe does it take? This place had already survived historically earthquakes and the walls didn't come down. 
It had survived frontal attacks and rear attacks and side attacks, and the walls didn't come down. So what kind of faith would cause walls to come down? Here we go. I've got five quick things. The first one is faith that goes against the odds. In spite of the odds. I've been there. I've walked around. Some of you have also been there. You've, you've walked around or at least been to Jericho. Charlotte, you've been to Jericho. Dennis and Nancy, you guys have been to Jericho. Did you, you didn't get to go to Jericho? You drove by it. Oh, oh. You skirted Jericho. You want, to make, you want me to make my point about skirting Jericho? There are some things in, sometimes in your life when you can't skirt Jericho. You can try it. And you can do it. And the end result will still be that what was in Jericho is still going to be there even though you went around it. Jericho. It's the gateway fortress to the land of Canaan. It is the city that controls. There's another city that's similar to this. It has gone through several world wars, and it's been the choke point to the Mediterranean. It's called the Gates of Gibraltar. Gibraltar. From Gibraltar, you can shoot across to Africa. That particular opening from the Atlantic to the Mediterranean, can be controlled with guns, big guns, by the way, but can be controlled, and everything going in and out of it can be controlled by one army strategically placed in one place. That's Jericho. Jericho, it's the gateway city to the land of Canaan. And yet God had promised his children that they were going to possess a land that was controlled by a choke point. Jericho. What was Jericho to the people of Joshua? What did they see? Three quick things. First of all, it is a city filled with pagans who don't believe in Yahweh. Secondly, it's the city that has strategic importance. You can't go beyond it. You can go around it, but until you conquer it, you don't have possession of the land called promise. And third, it is a city that is filled with human impossibility. You can't win the battle of Jericho. No one had ever conquered Jericho. Pagan belief. Any of you know people around you that don't believe? I mean, God? Maybe. Jesus? Good swear word. Son of God, personal Savior, is the only way to God's heaven. And it keeps getting fewer and fewer, and the drop-off is more significant. The religion in Jericho at the time was filled with immorality, and it was filled with idolatry. Now, I don't have to go far today to pick up the headlines of any newspaper, turn on the television, turn on the radio, or go to my computer and see a world that is filled with idolatry and immorality. How impossible is it for us to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world? Everybody? We, we assent to it pretty quickly. But the reality is that without God and faith in Jesus Christ, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. We're living in a damned world. And the only answer is for us to do some things that are so radical that unless we do them with faith in God, it's never going to happen. This walled city was a city that was built with walls so high that according to Deuteronomy, when they looked at the city, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 1, these walls went to the sky. We're not, we're not talking about a little mound of dirt. We're talking about walled city. Walled city. What could the Jews, these people of promise, these recently freed slaves do in the face of such impossibility. They could understand pretty quickly that they were never going to go straight at that city and say, our little army's going to take that city. They were never going to breach the walls. 
They were never going to scale it, climb it, and conquer it. Not going to happen. They had faith to believe in an impossible situation. I don't know what you're facing this morning. I can tell you my impossible situation. It's $170,000. That's the reality of my life these days. That's the reality of how impossible is it? I can't, I can't believe, literally cannot believe, that in the confines of these walls that the people who come here for worship have pledged $530,000. I can't believe it. What kind of an impossible situation are you facing? I don't know. But I'm here simply as your pastor this morning saying, by faith, if God could bring Jericho's walls down, by faith, if God can provide $170,000, by faith, your situation that's as impossible as mine today, by faith, that's how we're going to live. Because this whole series has been all about faith, that we are going to go forward. How are we going to go forward? We're going to go forward with one step. This faith plan that they were to follow was a strange plan of faith. How strange is it? In Joshua chapter 6, I'm going to go through it really quickly. Joshua chapter 6 says in verse 3, march around the town once a day for six days. That is not a battle plan. March around and put the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of what you're doing. That is not a battle plan. Put seven priests in front of it. That is not a battle plan. On the seventh day, go around seven times. Have the high priest blow the ram's horn, the shofar. Do that as they march. And on the seventh time around, have the people shout. (laughs) It sounds like, here's what it sounds like to me. It sounds like this new phenomenon that we have in the city of Seattle before a Sounders game. And people gather someplace downtown and go through Pioneer Square and they blow, and people are bomb, 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 and everybody, and it's it's a wall of people with sound. That's what it sounds like to me. Yet God had told their leader it was possible. He adds a few more instructions to this, gets more detailed. I, I, I've got to stop. I can't go any further than, are you nuts? <laughs> what are the chances of marching people, blowing horns, and screaming people in victory in a battle? How, and I know i got some military people that have served. What kind of battle plan is that? Gordon, what kind of battle plan is shout, silent, blow, scream, what kind of battle plan is that like? It's a rebel plan. That's a plan for disaster. <laughs> Joe, you're active. What? Crazy people. <laughs> Who else has been in the military that would think that that's a really cool battle plan? That, that, like that's, that's the thing to do. Okay, I got nobody taking me on that. Marching people, blowing horns, and shout. You know what that is? That's a recipe for disaster. Absolutely a recipe for disaster. It would be the greatest military blunder of all times, except for two words, by faith. These people in that moment encountered something entirely new and yet vital for all of us today. That their faith would somehow play out to give them a victory that they couldn't get any other way. I I need to go to Joshua chapter 6 for just a minute because it's it's the story. The gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. Why would you be afraid of shouting, blowing, silent, Stupid walking people. (laughs) Got to get to verse 2. Because here's the moment that changes everything. If I were writing the story, I would have written the story this way. But the Lord said to Joshua, Go and I will give you the city when you get there. 
But if anybody's got your Bible, you will see that it is not a future tense phrase. It is not something that is going to happen in the future. How does God talk to us? We say it around here pretty regularly. God is in my future just waiting for me to catch up, right? You've heard me say that at least one or two times. God is in my future just waiting for me to catch up. When God steps out of his eternity and walks into the garden, in the middle of what we call the fall, he speaks from the voice of not one who talks about things that will happen. He speaks from the voice of where he stands, seeing it already done. And I want to read you how the writer of old, Moses, records this moment. And the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho. Did you catch it? It's not a future moment. It is God from his future talking to Joshua in his present and telling him what the end result is already going to be. Any of you have uh, seen the, the second movie of Captain America? And there is a moment in the movie where the arch villain starts blowing everything up because Captain America has shown up with his troops. And it's on a little video screen. It's black and white. And he, he says, his mad scientist says, why are you doing this? And he says, because the battle is already over. We've already lost. Why did the people in Jericho shut up? Because somehow they knew that they had already lost the battle. Oh, you, you, you're just way too docile. It's, it's, I, I know it's, 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 it, 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 it's Labor Day weekend and you're already all tired out. Everybody? Do you get this? God, from his position in time, spoke to a man in his present and didn't say, you will. He says, I have already given you. Yes. Now, if that doesn't instill some faith, I have already given you. Can I make it really personal? I've already given you a job. Okay, I'm going to make it really personal. And I'm going out on an absolute limb. And, and I feel like Harley Thomas sawing himself off in that scaffolding in the potato house. And so if you've heard my story about my grandfather, because I'm sawing the limb off, and, and I'm not surely what's her name. Remember the lady who sawed herself off in the limb? She was one of Ramtha's. Anyway. Nah, nah, yeah, yeah. God has already somehow in his economy provided the 170,000, and I don't know where it is. Great, there are eight of us that are in faith in the room in the morning. He didn't say, I will. He didn't say, I might. He makes the statement, I have already done it. Yes. Done deal. Walls are coming down. Done deal. You shouldn't be surprised when it happens. Done deal. When God shows up, he shows up because it's a done deal. In the real sense, the battle is over, just like the arch villain of the Captain America. We've got to blow everything up because the battle's already over. The other thing that God did that's interesting, God put himself in the middle of the battle. God put himself in the middle of the battle because he put the priests carrying the ark in the middle of the battle. The ark. It's the most sacred thing in all of Christianity and Judaism. The ark of the covenant. It's just not a place that represents stuff that he did. It is the representation of his presence in the middle of his people. And he told them to take the ark and put it in the middle of the battle. I don't know what kind of battle you're in, but if you just could get the picture uh, that God himself has put himself in the middle of your battle. He put the ark out in front, and he said, I am going to lead this parade. He has put himself in the middle of your battle and says, I, will you follow me to where I know I want to take you? Isn't that the problem that we struggle with, is that we struggle with 
We want to lead our own parade. And we want to go where we want to go. And his challenge is that he wants us to follow him and he wants to be the leader of the parade. What were these um, people of Jericho thinking? These people are nuts, but we're afraid of them. Okay, uh, I am not a great negotiator, but I can be pretty bold sometimes. I walked in the middle of this phone conversation that started with this bank in Nebraska two weeks ago. And we had gotten rates for pieces of this from five to seven, and some places 8%. And several people just said, you're a church, and we won't even talk to the church. This particular group calls, and we have a phone conversation, and we send them some documents, and back and forth. And I said, here are my terms. Harley Thomas. <laughs> I'll take 20. I'd really like 25. No more than 5%. There was a silence on the other end of the phone. I'm going, okay, Gordon, we, we've been this route. We already know where we're going. We don't have to go far on this. We would consider that. A banker on the other end of the phone. How high are the walls? They are no match for the Almighty. That's how high they are. Marching people. Horn blowing. Shouting victory. Oh, and one more thing in the equation that changes everything. God. And what does it equal? And the walls came tumbling down. That's what it equals. That's what it equals. It's God who made the difference in Jericho, and it will be God who is going to make the difference for you. Now, I can't do what the walls of Jericho did because I can't, I'm not double jointed in my elbows. And when I teach walk through the Bible, I don't carry. Um, Liability insurance for those of you who aren't double jointed. So we always do the walls came in, because, but the walls actually went out. It's because the hand of God them. came down. Robert Morrison is recorded to have been the very first missionary to take the Protestant faith to China. the first man to take the gospel. He's on the ship, and the captain goes to him one day and says, rather sarcastically, what do you think you're going to do, convert all of China to this Jesus? <laughs> Robert Morrison thought for a minute and came back and said, no, I don't think I'll ever convert one person in China, but I know God will. Faith. Faith. This faith had an action to it. It was unbelievable, persevering obedience. Faith without obedience is foolishness. I haven't done this much around here, but I have lived my life on this next principle. I am a firm believer. I will lead the bandwagon to the call of faith. I will base my faith by looking at all of the facts. And I will do my best <laughs> to stay out of foolishness. We operate around here in faith and fact, staying away from foolishness. I, I, I love science, and, and I really like everybody. I like, I like medicine, and most things that most of you have as ailments, I, I've done research on and know and know what the doctors are going to prescribe. And, and, and you know, talk to me. 
I can tell you a lot about a lot of things that you have. But the one thing you don't want because you don't have any trust or faith or belief in me is you don't want me to do brain surgery. <laughs> and shortly after that, you sure don't want me to be your cardiologist. And I am not going to be the neurophysicist that opens you up and figures out what this particular neuron does when it's touching. Not doing that. Okay? You have faith in me in certain areas. And you have faith in your doctor. And you have belief in your doctor. Or you wouldn't go. When you sat down in that chair this morning, it took faith to sit down in that chair. Now, some of you have gone to the same chair and you've sat in the same seat for the five and a half years that we've been in this building. So you've pretty well got the faith thing all worked out. But if we suddenly change chairs in here on a Sunday morning, and you were like, hmm. Right? It takes faith to sit. It takes faith to buy your car. It takes faith to get in an elevator. If you didn't believe the elevator was going to either get you up or get you down, you take the stairs. These people had faith to believe that the Lord had actually talked to their leader, Joshua, and Joshua said, he has given us the city already. Now, what's it going to take? It's going to take one time a day to walk around in silence. Now we're going home. <laughs> day two. Day three. Day four. Do you get that Jericho had seen this something similar before? They had had all kinds of attacks. When they closed the gates, they closed the gates because they knew that they could survive on the inside a really long time. They had no idea that from beginning to end, this battle was going to be done in seven days. And in seven days, Jericho would no longer exist as they had known it. This faith act took diligent preparation. It took careful discipline. It took patient repetition. Ladies, not knocking you, but for seven days, you didn't say a word. Just saying. <laughs> when it came time, it took audacious, decibel-raising sound. Complete obedience. But it also was wrapped up in, and I'm not spending long on this, intentional compassion. And then faith acted in spite of any doubt. Now, everybody, everybody, I'm going to be done in about two and a half minutes. No, I, I, let me, everybody listen to me. The last two weeks, and my family knows it, Gordon's been in in the office, and Glenda's been in and out of the office. I have been on an absolute roller coaster of faith and doubt. And the whole time I know I'm preaching this message. I have had stalling faith, and I have had awkward faith, and I have had doubting faith, but I have never wavered from faith. I don't know how it's going to get done. And my very nature is, I'm trying to figure out always how it's going to get done. I'm not wired to do anything else. I'm not wired to do anything else. Vinyl and Mary Jane raised a faith son that was firmly committed to facts. If you have to have 100% certainty of the end result, that's not faith. Not faith. It took unbelievable faith to walk around and say nothing. But God was in the middle, and they were being obedient to what they were called to do, and they did it. They did it. Hudson Taylor, the man who changed the missionary movement of the world, and particularly China itself. He saw God do amazing things during his ministry. 
One day he sat down and he was reflecting on faith in the face of hopeless circumstances. It's in your bulletin. He reflected on his experience and he remarked, there are three stages in most great tasks undertaken for God. Impossible, difficult, done. The bad news is for your wall of impossibility that it is impossible. The good news is by faith. God. By faith, God. Impossible. Months ago, Gordon, we sat in my office. We're going, where are we going to go? You guys went and looked at church. Aaron and Charity went and looked at churches. We lo looked at properties. We looked. We were up and down and in and around. And uh, Aaron drives by 62nd in the middle of May, says nothing to me. I call him up two days later, say, I want you to meet me, and don't tell him where to meet. Just here's the address. The pastor lets us in because we're now standing on the doorsteps of Grace Lutheran Church. The for sale sign had been up about two weeks. That was the end of May. January 4th, Lord willing, we will be in the new building because we have to be out of here December 31st because this building is for sale. And we had no idea this building was going to go for sale. Our lease is done. We don't have a place January 1. By faith, God. Impossible. Difficult. Difficult. $1.3 and a half million dollars. Difficult. By faith. Impossible. Difficult. And now we're closing in on. The real battle is never with the people on the inside of the city that's walled that we're facing. The real battle is always going to be in the hearts and minds of those of us who say we follow God. That's where the real battle always is. Because remember, God never starts on the large size. He starts on the small size. And what he starts small becomes large. Amen. God started in the little town. Not Rome. Not New York City. Not Chicago. Not L.A. Not Shanghai. He started in a little town in the middle of the desert called Bethlehem. And from Bethlehem came his son who became the sinner savior. Yes. By faith, God. And the walls came tumbling down. Come on up beside me, Mr. Gordon.